Ruth, shalom. Shalom. Hi. Um, we got together to uh, speak about um, different responses um, one can find in Jewish uh, texts um, about uh, times of crisis and war. Um, I've known you for quite a while, and I can say that um, one of the first things I heard from you which made a great effect on me was this idea that one can uh, understand very clearly what's going on now in uh, current affairs and politics, etc., uh, by uh, reading very carefully old texts, and even if they come from a different place like East Europe, and even if they are in a different language like Yiddish, there's a lot of truth over there, and sometimes much more uh, truth and understanding than one can have in, uh, in current times. So um, we decided today to speak about um, maybe just one word and uh, go through it um, in different directions and angles. The word is uh, the Hebrew word tam, which is also used in Yiddish. Um, but I think uh, in the beginning we have to explain to our audience and to ourselves what exactly are we talking about. So um, the first First uh, stop to to begin with, uh, with this, trying to investigate this world, Tam, I think is the Tanakh itself. Always. And um, it's very interesting that one can see that the Ingr English translation, at least the one I have in the hand, uh, use, uh, uses different English words to translate the word Tam. So the first Tam we know is uh, our father, Yaakov. And the Tanakh says, um, The boys grew up. Esav became a skillful hunter and a man of the outdoors. Yaakov ish tam yoshev alim. But Jacob was a mild man who stayed in camp. Mild man. One option. If I go to a different place in Tanakh, to the book of Iov, uh, Job, so the Tanakh says, Ishaya be'eretz Uts, there was a man in the land of Uz, Iov Shmo, his name was Iov, ve'aya ha'ishahu tam v'yashar, that man was blameless and upright. Different mm -hmm. translation. Right. And a few uh, uh, psukim later, uh, the Satan comes to Hashem and they discuss Yov and Hashem tells him, Vayomer Adonai Satan, Hasamta Libcha Lavdi Yov, have you noticed my servant Job? Ein Kamo Ba'aretz Ish Tam Vyashar. There is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man. So mild, blameless, upright. That's uh, the first stop, and of course we have um, in our Haggadah Shel Pesach the four sons, and one of them is the Tam. So, what would you be your best translation and interpretation of this word? <laughs> well, to tell you the truth, I think that's why we're here. And uh, since you so kindly introduced me in one way, I have to say that uh, one of the things that I've learned, especially in the joy of teaching texts and thinking of texts with you, is the importance of history. Uh, because I chose the field of literature because I thought everything was in it. Everything is in literature. But the truth is that history is extraordinarily important to be paired with literature because when you see the context, within which works were written, conceived, and even translated, as we'll see. That's so important because, um, as you pointed out, the translation is an interpretation. And what we're talking about here are interpretations of the Tam, of this figure of simplicity, of uprightness, of um, you know, it, it tells you that this is quite complicated. And you see what a paradox we have here. Tom is supposed to be the most simple, the plainest. And certainly in the Haggadah, we have the Chacham. 
then we have the rasha, and then we have the tam, and then we have the shein and yodea lishol. Okay, so that is like the child, we'll leave him out. But the tam is interesting, who is he? So it's obviously compared to the others, he's simpler than both the first two brothers, right? I mean, the Chacham is really smart. By the way, the Russia can be even smarter. So those are two guys with really great intelligence. And he is Tamim, you know, a simple guy. Well, the texts that we've chosen are so interesting because they are responses to crises, big crises, different kinds. Um, and they choose to face crisis through the figure of this Tam, which each of them interprets completely differently. And by the way, uh, in such complicated ways that if anybody thinks that we're going to summarize this here in a nutshell and say, you see, here's how I would translate it, not at all. It, it, it makes it more complicated. It just opens up the complexity of it. Okay, yeah. so we just want to try and open up things, not to uh, wrap them up completely? I think so. Um, okay, so what the, what the Yaakov Ishtam and Iov Ishtam and the Tam San from Agadash and Pesach, we move to modern times, uh, modern Jewish history and modern Jewish literature, and we stop um, with a, a fascinating figure. Uh, not many Israeli, Israelis, I'd say, will... Um, describe Rabbi Nachman of Braslav as the opener of modern Jewish literature, but uh, you'd say it's, it's the, a good uh, definition, right? It's the right thing to I, say. Well, there are many, and it depends whether you're emphasizing Hebrew or whatever. In Yiddish literature, when I started to teach, you know, a teacher has a wonderful job, but the most important job is how do you, where do you start the curriculum, or how do you shape the curriculum? And I decided that I would start with Rabbi Nachman, uh, partly because that is where modern Jewish storytelling and modern literature, really literature, does seem to start, and also because of the enormous influence he had on all the writers who came afterwards. So it's a very good starting point, and, by the way, because of how sophisticated a thinker he was. Uh, so, so although we, we meet in this uh, character from in the Ukraine in the late uh, 18th uh, century and the beginning of the 19th century, right. extremely sophisticated and in many ways modern and very influential on modern writers decades ahead. Right. Okay, so, so of course I think this is um, maybe well known that one of the most important stories of Rabbi Nachman is uh, Maaseh Michacham. Um, I know from my friends who follow the teachings of Ravi Nachman that the uh, tendency for Tmimut uh -huh. is extremely important. Uh -huh. Like this is one thing he demanded from his uh, followers to be simple and Tamim, Pashut, Vitam as a contradiction to other things. Um, but for those who haven't read the story at all or for a long time, Maybe you can describe in a few words what's the story about. Well, a few words. <laughs> I would have to because otherwise we could just read the story and that might be the most fascinating thing of all. I really commend it to everybody, even if you've read it before, to read it again. And also, by the way, um, the interpretation of Adin Steinsaltz. Who, um, who gives a wonderful interpretation of this story. So the story of the Chacham and the Tam begins with a crisis. Uh, they are both the sons of two householders, of two fathers, and the fathers lose their fortunes. So you can think of this in, I mean, all these stories of Rabbi Nachman are very symbolic. This one is the plainest, I think, in its symbolism, because you could almost say, well, I understand this without the symbolism. But you can see that what he means is that that great world, uh, the world of sovereignty or the world of perfection, whatever it was, breaks. And then these two boys are left on their own. And who are they? The Chacham and the Tam. And they are brought up together. So at first they are like brothers, these two boys. Um, but the dichotomy between them is absolute and it becomes even more absolute as the story goes on. So we see now how do they face the world 
when they go out on their own with no money and anything? Well, the Tom is by far the simpler one in the story. And he becomes a shoemaker. Now, it's interesting. Is he uh, a shoemaker who's good at making shoes? You would think that one of the things that Rabbi Nachman might want to point out is this is a person who is good at his craft. He's only an artisan, but an artisan can be so good at doing what he does. No. This is a shoemaker who makes shoes like triangles, right? What? Isn't that an interesting concept? That this man, he did not want to make us believe that what he was talking about is someone who is a craftsman and therefore good at this skill. This is someone who isn't even wonderful at his skill. But what gift does this simple man have? Sameach Bechelko. He is happy with his lot. And really, in a very strange way, his wife brings him the little food that they have and he says, oh, thank you, wife. This is such wonderful mead when she brings him a glass of water. Or this is such wonderful meat when she brings him a simple dish of groats or something. This is his personality. This is how he goes through life. And he takes whatever people will give him for the shoes. And he is simple. And this is basically the storyline. Now, the Chacham is infinitely more interesting and the truth is that when you read this story, you understand that Rabbi Nachman could identify psychologically much more actively with the Chacham, <laughs> right? Because he tells us so much about this Chacham, and there it is fascinating. So the Chacham goes out into the world. He sees people in the marketplace, uh, merchants coming and going. He thinks, gee, I'm going to go with them. So he can go. He learns languages. Okay. Then afterwards, he realizes that he has to have skills. So he becomes a wonderful doctor. So then he becomes a wonderful goldsmith. Um, the goldsmith tells us something, for example. So he becomes this marvelous craftsman. He makes these beautiful things. Does this give him satisfaction? No. Why? So he shows you how interesting this is. When a client comes and buys something beautiful from him, and finds a fault in it, he's very angry. What, he doesn't appreciate my skill? Okay. When a client comes and buys something that he thinks is not so great, and the client is overwhelmed with it, he thinks, oh my God, this man doesn't even understand the value of the goods. You see, he gets into the skin of this characters. One who takes what is and makes the most of it, and the other one who begins to be more and more dissatisfied. So this is one of the qualities that he shows us developing in this. I, we can't talk about the whole story, but just two parts of it. So one part is that then a, a summons comes to each of them, a summons from the king. The simple man is, or whatever, the Tom, right? Um, absolutely delighted. Really? So there he goes. And he begins to prosper because he makes sure that he learns something so that he is more presentable to the court. And he rises and rises with this expectation that he is now before the king. Our clever man is so smart, the Schacham. The king, he says to the messenger, do you know, did you see the king? Where is this king? And of course, the messenger can't prove to him that there is a king. So he does not believe in this. And he subverts himself because he does not follow that summons. And then that part of the story develops. And then the last part of the story, there we will probably want to pause on that for a number of reasons, is so interesting. The last part of the story is the devil comes for them. And the simple man, the Tom, is terrified. And what does he do? He goes to look for the Baal Shem. He knows that he needs some help. So he goes to look for the Baal Shem. And the Baal Shem, in fact, gives him whatever strengths he needs. It says, you know, amulets, 
need something, you know, something to hold on to. And he's saved from the evil spirit. But when the evil comes to the Chacham, he says the same thing as he says when the king sends for him. What? The devil? You expect me to believe in the devil? He laughs. And of course, he lands up in the swamp. And he can't get out of the swamp. And um, at the end of the story, like a deus ex machina, you know, really from the outside, the poor <laughs> and, and happy Tom, with the help of the Baal Shem, they come together and they rescue the Chacham from the swamp. Um, th this is the least believable part of the story. It's just sort of added as a coda. Um, I think that that uh, I think that that I, uh, that Rabbi Nachman wanted to end the story, and he really wanted to end it in some way, definitively. So he shows that yes, even at the end, it is possible if these two people are still brothers in some way. It is possible for the simple man, with the help of the Bashem, of the person who is gifted in this way as a leader, as a spiritual leader, they can help even the Chacham out of the swamp. He wants to show this happening. But in the meantime, uh, you see, as with literature, it's so amazing. We all want a happy ending. But the truth is, it's the story itself. Um, in teaching literature, I once found a wonderful example. They compared it to a football game. They said, you know, if you were only interested in the score of the football game, you wouldn't have to watch the football game. You would just tune in the next morning and you'd see who won and who lost by what score, he said. You see, literature is not like that. The literature is watching the game develop. You're not there for the score. So, um, so th th this is really uh, why I commend the story so much, to see the, uh, the subtlety of, of, and what he was worried about. What, what was on... Rabbi Nachman's mind. Right, so, so um, on, one can clearly see the modern aspect of the story. For instance, um, a, a, legacy, a house of fathers with a legacy that falls apart, you can find that in great German and English novels Absolutely. for sure. Yeah. And uh, the Chacham, the wise man, seems like a self-made man, maybe even in some kind of American version, Absolutely. out in the world, doing his thing by himself, self-dependent. And um, the question, one question is, is the devil a, something that comes from, you know, a Ukrainian medieval imagination, one option, second option, something very modern <laughs> then, that one could meet uh, in modern times. Or, or even from within, because a, a very curious part of the story is that when the devil comes, one of the ways in which the Chacham mocks him, he says, that's probably my brother, he says. That's probably my brother pretending to be the devil. Really? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Uh, that this is what occurs to uh, the Chacham, that the devil is really somebody from the inside who's playing a trick on me. Um, but, but to your point, I think that it's quite obvious that one of the things that was on uh, Rabbi Nachman's mind, first and foremost at that point in writing this particular story and some of the others, was the Enlightenment. As you said, the end of the 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century, this is when these ideas were coming in. Rationalism, trusting in the human uh, personality and in human competence and in the human mind to solve all problems and to make everything better and to face everything in the world. This is what he felt was hugely dangerous. And so I would say that what we most dramatically see is the way in which this Chacham embodies the Enlightenment in so many ways. Um, and what he says about the Enlightenment, you see, he sees nothing admirable about it. Yes, he sees mastery of everything, but this mastery does not bring him happiness. 
It does not even bring him in the story's terms competence, really, because at the end of the day, he does not, he's not able, for example, he doesn't stay home. We didn't even say that. The Tom stays home and guards the home. When the Chacham has nowhere to go, where does he come? He comes to the home of the Tom, because the Tom has maintained the home, whereas the Chacham goes out into the world. He doesn't give a damn for, you know, what he has to preserve. So that's one thing, and the modernity part of it. But the interesting thing is, and that's why I'm so glad that you started with uh, the Haggadah, this is very radical in terms of Judaism itself. Because after all, the Chacham is also the rabbinate. It's not just modernity. It's also Chochma, you know. Oh, you know, the wonderful interpretations of Shas, you know. Boy, you know, this was the great genius the Jews valued above all else. The Chacham, he's so great, you see. Listen, I think that even deeper in a way than uh, Rabbi Nachman's uh, trying to uh, reorder our values very drastically is to say, make sure that you are not making the mistake of overvaluing something which is not the most valuable at the expense of what is the most valuable, you see. So you see how, how many things are here in this before we even get to the translation or the term. Right. Yeah. But before we get there, what, um, what's the great danger in that world of uh, wisdom of the rabbis that Rabbi Nachman stands in a radical place against? What's he worried about? It's interesting, isn't it? You know, at the end of the century, or no, for further into the century, we get uh, Rabbi Salanter, who is also worried about uh, the over-rationalization, uh, the overstudy, And what he wanted is to develop the moral personality through his Musar movement, right? I don't think that that's Rabbi Nachman's take on it. The Tmimut that he's thinking of is he really believes that faith in God, as he sees it, the belief that God rules, that God rules us, not that we can supersede God, and not even that the interpretation of the Torah is greater than the Torah itself, you see. I think that he really wants to reorder the focus of real faith, you live with a depth of experience, of trust in that ultimate, that makes you see your place in life very differently, you know? That you allow yourself your own imperfections, you allow yourselves the imperfections of others. That's not where you place the emphasis, because you know that there is something supreme that there is something ultimate good. Um, this is what's so difficult for the modern person, and that's why this story is such a challenge to the modern person. Uh, I, I confess to you, I teach this story uh, with great enthusiasm and with great humility and respect, but do I for one moment identify after I finish the story and say, gee, yeah, really, what, <laughs> what I want to be is more like the Tom? Unfortunately, no. The only thing about it that does come home with the years is this element of gratitude being more important than grievance. This is one of the things that one takes away from this and hopefully that one internalizes completely. This is very important. And I never wanted to be a man, <laughs> as I have to say. In my family, I was very happy to be born a woman. Um, however, the older I get, the more I want to incorporate in my life something like the uh, twillin laying that you do in the morning. Um, not for the act of laying twillin, but just for going through a set of gratitudes you know, moda nilafanecha, this one can say, but also you have to make your own thing. Thank you for this, thank you for that. If you don't articulate it every day, if you don't bless it every day, 
then there's a dimension of life that you really do lose. That, that's uh, very yeah. powerful for you, what you just said. Um, so we have this Chacham person. He, he, he can't believe there's a king. And I assume in Rabbi Nachman's tales, the king is a god. Yes, I th think so. <laughs> okay, so no king, no devil. Um, we're looking for the modern uh, aspect of this whole um, uh, story. Let's uh, move forward to the reception of the story later in time. And I know that over here you found some uh, important uh, insights, may maybe even treasures. For instance, the very famous but problematic uh, translation of the story, adaptation of the story by Martin Buber. Yes, this is so fascinating. This is, you know, reception history is sometimes just something automatic that you do because you want to see, okay, what happened to this work in time. But here, the reception history is part of Jewish history. So Martin Buber, you know, the great the German philosopher, is the person who popularized Hasidism, Hasidut. He became so enthusiastic about Hasidut. And he worked with Agnon, you know, uh, who had his very much different, you know, relationship to the Hasidut. So why is this so important to me? Because I first came among the stories of the Hasidim through Martin Buber's translation, translated into English. When I, was, I just picked it up somewhere, the tales of Rabbi Nachman, it was. And I read this story of the Chacham. Anyway, when I started to really study Yiddish literature and so on, I went to the Yiddish to see, uh, I mean, I had to read it in the original. I look at the original and I'm flabbergasted. <laughs> Buber cut out the last part of the story. He, did, he didn't translate the last part of the story. There's no devil. He finishes it with the king and with the reception of the king. Now, this is amazing. And then, of course, the English translator of Buber, of these stories of Rabbi Nachman, translated according to Buber. And so you never had the devil in it. So it, it became so interesting. So at first I thought, oh, I understand, because Buber was translating for his German audience. And he thought that the Germans, where that supernatural element comes in of the devil, and especially the devil, uh, the, the uh, Tom having to find the Baal Shem, you know. What is his German audience going to do with this? So I thought to myself, you know, he probably left it out because he knew that it wouldn't be able to appeal to them. You know, with the years then when you read about Buber becoming part of Brit Shalom and the way in which he saw the world, I thought, oh no, I thought. You know, he just didn't believe in the power of evil. <laughs> I thought that one of, the, one, of the, one of the difficulties of Buberism is that um, he does not really, really understand uh, evil <laughs> the way Rabbi Nachman understood evil. That is maybe the ultimate challenge, right, you see? And he, he said, Buber says somewhere, he said, uh, he doesn't share humanity with Hitler. Uh, this is so fantastic. I mean, you understand him completely in a way, but that's the problem of German Jewry in a way, of that uh, of the reform movement in that Buberian mode, right? What? You don't share humanity with this? Well, then you're going to fall into the slough. You're going to fall into the pit. No one's going to be able to drag you out of that pit, you see? So here is where, you know, the reception of this story becomes so part of the story that it uh, becomes part of our history. Part of but tell me, in this specific point, doesn't the word Tam get a new interpretation that Buber is also some kind of a Tam person, but in the sense that he doesn't understand really how the world works and then he's not just a mild or simple person, but in a way not clever enough to understand what's going on? Can that be? Well, I, in a way, I mean, I'm not enamored of I, thou. Uh, I mean, you know, I understand its power in some ways, but yes, so I would say that, that there is something about it that leaves out uh, experientially uh, and psychologically um, something which really became 
all too important to us. And, um, and th 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 this is very painful in a way because um, one doesn't want to mock that element. Um, th the Ishtamim, who really does not want to confront evil at all, we know people like that. You know, we, we know many people like that. They really want to be like them. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. They cannot tolerate it. Um, and we all have the problem as parents. I need not say today in these days, but in general. Um, at what age do we introduce our children to the concept of evil? It's not what we want to do. We wish that we could protect our children the same way that we cradled them when they're babies. We want to cradle them always and make sure that they can stay tamim, those who are that way, the children who are that way. You know, children love justice. They just love it. They hate injustice, many children. Um, so there is that quality, uh, that eternal quality, that you wish that you could cultivate it freely, but the story and life, may I say, makes us aware of the fact that uh, we have to bring it into human affairs. So I, I feel an obligation to say something about this that it's not easy and it's extremely, extremely relevant for the Israeli situation now, Please. following exactly what you just said. Look, we know in history that Jews in France during the trial of, of Dreyfus, they were stunned and surprised that they there was something going on against them. And again, you have these German Jews holding up their First World War medals yes. uh, to try and stop them being sent to, to a, a camp. And um, Jews who promoted and maybe in some way even invented the Bolshevik uh, Revolution and then, then always surprised that it comes with all the anti-Semitism that they wanted to avoid. So that's all kinds of um, historical uh, yeah. like processes that you could see Jews in functioning as very tamim people in, the, in, a negative, in a negative way. And it's true, I can tell you this as an Israeli parent, that it's, it, it's, it's extremely difficult to figure out how, how, how to explain your young children what you see on television. Yes. Why do people behave like this and that? Yes, yes, terrifying. Yes, I think at this point, I must say that this is, uh, uh, to me, this would be the hardest part of being an Israeli at this particular time. Don't think we don't confront it in our own way. But the degree of evil to which one has been exposed here, viscerally, at this point, that one cannot close one's eyes to, is beyond anything that we have ever been asked to face before. Um, I mean, the people who went through the Shoah say, well, this is no Shoah. Don't, don't even make the comparison. And this is true. That's not the point. Um, but to have the entire people, and this is what the cruelest part of what our current enemies have done. Uh, they, have, they have figured out a psychological cruelty that nobody figured out before. They looked at all the good qualities of the Israelis, of all these wonderful qualities, which have to do with uprightness, which have to do with all those qualities that the Bible sees as being ishtamim in that good sense, right? And that's who they went for, first of all. Notice that they did not attack on the West Bank. <laughs> they did not attack in the shtachim. They attacked who they knew were the sweetest people, the people who believed most in peace. That's who they wanted to rape. That's who they wanted to kill. That's who they wanted to tear apart. And, um, and they went for the values of family life, of beauty. Oh, do the Jews value the individual life? Oh, how wonderful. Well, we'll show them, you know. You know, I think that the hardest part, yes, of children, but for ourselves, too, we don't want to think about the levels of depravity that have been reached among the people who live closest to us here. 
and that level of depravity that they are trying to bring to the rest of the world. You see, what they're trying to do is they're trying to convince the rest of the world that their depravity is the good and that the goodness of the Jews of Israel is the bad. So you understand how, anyway, we don't want to go too far afield no, in this, but there is this tamim is really, as you say, it is something we can't escape from. Okay, we, we won't go deeper into that, Ruth, but I think you, you made the point how a very minor uh, issue in the world of literature, for instance, what Martin Buber did, what a translation of a old Jewish story, how relevant and powerful the consequences of can be of that. Uh, yes, not to eradicate it. Right. Yes, right. Okay, Wonderful. so um, I, 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 in, the, in the shadow of what we spoke about, we, I think we can move to, forward to one more very important uh, stage of reception of this idea of Tam. And this is the wonderful short story of uh, Yitzhak Bashevi Zinger, Gimpel Tam. To those uh, of, who are listening to us and read Hebrew, I just want to say that uh, uh, Mamash recently a new translation came out, so it's uh, available in every good uh, bookshop in Israel Wonderful. today. Um, I always like to ask you this question. Um, please tell me something about Bashevi Zinger and did you know him and what do you remember uh, oh. of him? Well, I did have the privilege of knowing uh, Isaac Bashev as singer. Um, how I got to know him was um, in a wonderful way. When our oldest, uh, when my first child was born, a, a son, uh, we wanted to have a pidyon haben. And um, so I called a Kohen whom I knew in New York. And I said, would you mind coming to Montreal and being the Kohen for our Pidyon Haben? And he said, why do you need me? Bashevis is coming to Montreal that day, and he's going to be speaking. Why don't you ask him to be the Kohen? So I said, okay. So I wrote a letter to the Forvitz where he was working, and I said, would you like to be the Kohen in the afternoon when you're speaking and so on? And he said, <laughs> I have the letter. He says, es wird mir schon nicht schatten. In other words, I've reached the age where it can't harm me anymore. <laughs> it can't do me any harm <laughs> to come. So he came and he was the Kohen <laughs> for uh, Billy's Pidyon uh, Haben. It's very moving. And, uh, and then you could see what kind of a person. So first of all, when he came in, he uh, wanted to kiss my hand like a Polish <laughs> and it's a very strange mixture of things personally. Um, uh, it would be too charming and wonderful to go into all these details. But the other difficulty thing, the other thing that I would like to say is that when he, we gave him the f silver dollars that my husband had gotten from the bank, he looked at these things. He was so nervous, he asked people in the room, what do I do? What do I do with these? He was worried. Does this really belong to him? Does this really his? Um, so uh, in that sense, the tamim part of him, you know, as he always shows himself to be that child who in some way never quite adjusted completely to the world. Hmm. You just saw that aspect of it too. Okay, so Ruth, I have to tell you, um, I don't know if I ever told you this, but I, I really, um, I love Bashevis. I mean, I read it in the Hebrew translation, and there's a lot. For instance, this huge novel, uh, Mush The Mushkat Family, yes. I find that one of the most, the, maybe one of the best novels in history. Wow. I, I, um, so I'm very attracted to his writing and to his uh, character. Uh, I know it would be a mistake to uh, present him as some kind of a teacher of something specific, you know, he, he wasn't, right? He was very com complicated yes, yes. and uh, an artist more than a teacher of uh, values. But still, we want to learn something deep and relevant from him. Is that, is that right? It is. Well, I, I think we'll only deal with one story. And I'm so glad that it's now available in this new translation in Hebrew. Because many of us have to depend on translations, although the Yiddish is absolutely remarkable. Uh, one of the things to say about Basheva Singer uh, that you've emphasized is he is one of the great storytellers. He is a natural novelist and storyteller. 
you know, not all people who went into writing were natural <laughs> writers, but he was born with this. He loved stories and loved reading them. And, and obviously this came much more naturally to him than I think to any other modern uh, Yiddish writer, certainly than I know, and to most Hebrew, uh, English writers as well. So that's a gift, right? Uh, to think in story terms, and mm -hmm. that, that is one of his gifts. But I think one of the interesting things about him, which comes to uh, light in this story and in everything, is, um, you see, he came out of a very, very uh, religious household, the son of a rabbi and the grandson of a rabbi on his mother's side. Uh, the mother much more on the Hasidic or spot side. The father, uh, I'm sorry, the father much more on the Hasidic side. The mother on the much more rationalist side, but both very, very moralistic. And um, he says he never heard arguments more sophisticated than the ones in his home. But more than that, he never saw goodness that measured up to anything compared to what he saw in his family. So this is what he grows up with. And then, because of his older brother, who was already a successful writer, and his older sister, who wanted to be a writer, and so forth, suddenly he goes into the modern world of Warsaw, where he goes into an atelier where there are naked models, and where it's across the street, basically. On one side of the street is his family living this extraordinarily morally cultivated way of life. Across the street is this depraved way of life, really, because yes, there's sex, and yes, there's individual self-expression, and there's literature, and there's art, and there's dance, and there's all these wonderful things which he now becomes a part of. But he cannot resolve that dichotomy. This is even before the war. This is very early on in his writing, you see that whereas many Yiddish writers uh, and many modern Jewish writers and many modern writers, they see their job as in some way reconciling what happens in modernity. How do you take a world without faith ultimately and how do you make goodness on another level? Do you do it through socialism? Do you do it through humanism? How? You know, and, uh, and I would say in some ways the concept of modern orthodoxy, if one can say, you know, or modern, you see what I mean? This, mm -hmm. We all look for that. And this is, I say most of us live that way, right? We don't want to live a dichotomous life. No, we forge some kind of synthesis. But Shevis's strength in a way, humanly it must have been more difficult for him. But as a writer, you see, this is where he, some people will find that he fails us, you see no middle ground. Uh, that's what makes a story so exciting in some ways, you see. Um, he goes back into the world of sin, where sin was really sin. You were either sinful or you repressed the sin. So in that sense, you see, the dichotomy is very much like Rabbi Nachman. Either you're good in which case you follow the commandments. And at the end of many Bashevis novels, the hero who has tried to live in the world and who has gone from Avera to leads to another Avera, it's not that mitzvah, mitzvah you see, it's mm -hmm. not the way he sees it. He sees it as one sin will lead to another sin. So if you have sex with a woman uh, out of wedlock, ha ha, tomorrow you'll be doing it with the two women, and then with three women, and in some of his novels with four women. How do you get out of that? In a Bashevis novel, there's only one way to get out of that. You go up, you wall yourself up, either in Mea Sharim or in, a, in Poland, if you're still in Poland, in a brick house where you have to get food put given to you through the wall because you do not trust yourself, you see. This is really, so it's good that we start with that maybe, that this is the background of him. I don't think it's being untrue to him to say that, that this is why he did not trust uh, modernity, even though he knew that he had no option but to be part of it, right? Right. Um. 
Uh, yes, very important. Um, <laughs> yeah. At least the option to look at life as you just uh, describe it through his uh, through his work. Okay, so for those who are listening to us and never read this beautiful short story, Gimpel Tam, what's it about in a nutshell? Ah, well, it's again, uh, please don't let me, don't trust the, the storyteller here. You have to look at the, at the original. Um, so if we, I'll read it in English. Uh, um, if, um, if I, uh, yes, if I can find uh, the page here. Um, no, I don't know if I can. Anyway, um, so uh, he, he begins and he says, um, I am, oh, I do have it here. Please excuse me here. Um, I, this is in Saul Bellow's translation. Again, how interesting is uh, the transmission of this story. I am Gimple the Fool, Bellow translates. I am Gimple the Fool, right? I don't think myself a fool. On the contrary, but that's what folks call me. They gave me the name while I was still in school. I had seven names in all. Imbecile, donkey, flaxhead, dope, glump, ninny, and fool. And the last name stuck. Just one. What did my foolishness consist of? I was easy to take in. And then he explains what that means. And, and it's very important to read every word here because what he tells us right at the very beginning is, I wasn't afraid. Don't think that I was afraid. You know, if somebody wanted to hit me, I could hit back. But he tells us right in the first paragraph that that was not his way. So Bashevis is setting up the Tam here uh, in a way not to think of him as, um, as a weakling because the story is going to be very hard on Gimple Tom, but he's not a weakling. We have to understand that. If he wanted to, he could be different. And this is where the complexity of Gimple comes in, Tom, as opposed to the Tom in Rabbi Nachman. Um, Gimple has choice throughout. He chooses, and he is the storyteller himself. He is interpreting himself He's not being interpreted by someone else. He is telling you what's the price of being Gimple Tom. What does it feel like? How much humiliation is there in it? And it's pure humiliation. So, um, so just to be sure that we understand the context of this, this story was written for the Pesach, the Passover issue of their Yiddisher Kemfer, which was at that point probably one of the best uh, literary journals in New York, Yiddish literary journals in New York, the Pesach issue of 1945. So during the Second World War, Bashevis Singer had started to write stories in the voice of the devil, trying to write a new kind of story that dealt very much with evil. And did he ever have a problem? Because he wanted to face this. But his language is Yiddish. And he, more than any other writer, was aware of the fact that you cannot do, in the language which you write, you cannot do something which is not, it doesn't belong in the language. So how do you describe Hitler? And how do you describe what's happening in Germany in Yiddish? You see, how, how, how does one do that? How does one introduce the enormity of evil into Yiddish? I mean, in a sense, this was his creative problem. And um, his fellow writer, Dan Jacobson, a, a uh, South African writer, once wrote a review of Bashevis in which he wrote, um, Bashevis imports evil, imports evil into the world of Eastern Europe. And he says, listen, these rabbis' wives, these shopkeepers, these people, what are you doing to them? H how can you make them into these people who fornicate in the way that you show some of them doing, falling into evil the way they do? You know, saying to Bashevis as if he is committing a crime historically, right, that he is shaped. But you see, from a 
literary point of view. This is the th fact. He had to do it in Yiddish, in the terms of Yiddish. So that's why he brings in the demonology, you see. This is where the devil becomes real. And, and, and he has to see it overtaking people, you see, in, the real, in real life. So, so look how, how complicated and interesting this is, because the Chacham of Rabbi Nachman, beginning of the 19th century, rejects the devil. Bashevi Zinger <laughs> needs him to try to explain to himself, to himself what's going on. Right. And the difference between Buber and Bashevi, so Buber takes the Yiddish into German, leaves something out, <laughs> and Bashevi in Yiddish takes the German and needs, right. needs all kinds of new things to explain to yourself what's going on. And again, I must say, we're not going deep into this now, but how relevant all of this is to us now finding the words to describe, understand this uh, in Yiddish, riches of, of our enemy now. Yes. It's very difficult for us. Very. And that's why this story, by the way, written in 1945, you can imagine it couldn't be more timely to today. And, um, and it is really a remarkable uh, construct. This story is, is really quite remarkable. Um, because, you see, in Yiddish, and why the Hebrew is going to be better, because the Hebrew is going to be able to do what the English could not do. Why? Because the Hebrew is being written for the same audience, basically, with the same background as the Yiddish writer. So how does he do it in Yiddish? He says, Ich bin Gimpeltam, ich halt mich nicht für Kenar, nicht Kenar. You see, he makes the distinction. I don't think myself a fool, right? Uh, so, but Bello uses the same word, but of course, as far as Bashevis is able to could do it, he, he has a differentiation. So, ich bin dem Pultam, aber ich halte mich nicht verkehrt nach. Verkehrt, just the opposite. Nor um, delight, this is what people call me, mit azat zu nehmen nicht. Men hat mich angehäuben, rufen a soi noch in Cheder. Sieben zu nehmen habe ich gehabt, wie Yisroi. See, what he says in, he, in Yiddish is, I had seven names like Yisro. Again, the Hebrew can do that because every Hebrew reader will know, or is supposed to know, that yes, in the Bible, Yisro is referred to in so many ways that Rashi had to say, why is Yisro referred to in so many ways? So the, <laughs> so the expression, I have many things like Yisro, it was already used in, in Jewish vocabulary. Bello has to leave that out. So you see, the intimacy of this story is in a way lost in English. But Bello was right, because he was writing for the English reader. He did not want the English reader to say, what, Jethro? What, uh, I had seven names like Jethro? What the hell is this? You know, He couldn't, because Bello is also a gifted storyteller. So he had to do in English what he had to do for the, so, so in a way, he deprives it and tries to put it in through other means, mm -hmm. you see, but brilliantly in his own way. So Gimple Tom, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a word, how does he make Gimple the Tom in the modern world? This is, again, Bashevis's genius. He understood that the modern world, it's all about sex. This was his, he realized that you could say everything through sexuality, and particularly for him, it was so sweet because Yiddish literature had never dealt in this really, in this coarse way before, not to this degree. Yiddish is so, and Yiddish culture was really so delicate about this subject. Well, this was Bashevis's joy. He could open it up. So what is more Tom than a cuckold, which is the fool of Western comedy and Western culture? The husband whose wife has sexual relations with other men, and he doesn't know about it. So they used to play in the theater. This guy was always played as the fool of fools. Ha ha. You see, he doesn't even know that at the deepest level his wife is betraying him, and he doesn't know this. So this is a story about the town, the town of Frampol, 
where Gimple lives, they laugh. They marry him off to the town prostitute. And 17 weeks after, she gives birth to a child. And he believes the child is his. Ha, ha, ha. How they laugh throughout, you see. Pure humiliation. But Gimple is telling us this story. And uh, there are all kinds of stages of this story, as in the story that we spoke of before. Uh, and at one point, when they laugh at him, he says, today it's your wife you don't trust, tomorrow it's God himself that you won't believe in. He says it in such a simple way. Really? So this is not symbolically written, but who can miss that? So he's saying, it's the same uh, impulse at work. You call this person foolish. You call this person, um, you know, a, a shlemiel, right? Uh, easy to take advantage of. Um, and doesn't want to see the evil. But he makes the comparison himself. Okay, if you begin to be a skeptic, and you distrust your wife, uh, okay, today it's your wife you distrust, tomorrow you won't believe in God. Today, tomorrow you'll be that chacham of, uh, of the uh, story of Rabbi Nachman, you see. And so he's, what, what Basheva Singer does in this story is he makes the situation more and more ridiculous in a way. There's a point at which Gimple comes home and he sees his apprentice in bed with his wife. And his wife is able to convince him to go out to take care of the baby next door, right? And in that moment, the apprentice disappears and the wife pretends that he was never there to begin with. When you, when I've taught this story and it's so interesting. Students have a problem with it, we all do, and they say, Gimple is just rationalizing. <laughs> He's rationalizing all the time. You could call it that, yes. I mean, Bashevis is very much aware, you know, the story is very much aware of the... Um, but you see how, again, how radical this is in its... Um, what he's really saying is either you take it or you don't. And, I mean... I cannot read this otherwise than as a story of the Jews of Eastern Europe, like his parents, tamim, right, humiliated. Because a word that is never used, but to me it's the most powerful word, is the humiliation of what the Germans did. Oh, this clever people, the Jews, in five years, we can find a way of tricking them into their own death and they'll just follow. They'll just come, you know. We will say, you're going to work to the work camp and they come to the work camp and we gas them to death, you know, whatever. The Jews were made to feel as if they were very uh, Foolish, and unfortunately, a lot of very intelligent Jews, like Hannah Arendt, for example, blamed the Jewish councils. <laughs> if you had not made the lists, if you had not done this, you know, then this would never have happened. Yes, well, it didn't happen because of the, what the Jewish making the lists. It happened because of the German uh, in, in genius putting its genius to the task of getting rid of these people, right? But you see what I mean by Gimple here? Um, that Gimple becomes, from one stage to the next, we see him undergoing more and more humiliation and going farther and farther into an almost conscious acceptance of his fate until, because he doesn't leave this out, until Elka, his wife, dies. And on her deathbed, she says to him, Gimple, I'm going to face my maker. I have to tell you the truth now. And at that moment, she tells him that none of the children was his. None. 
He's been raising them as his children, and none of them is his. Well, at that point, what? Then he can't pretend anymore, you see? He has to face it. And so um, the devil appears to him in a dream, and he says, what are you doing? And Gimple says, what should I be doing, eating kreplach? Because <laughs> 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 it is a funny story. We forgot to say that it's a funny story. Uh, and, and the sweet devil says to him, you're a baker, right? It's very easy. You make urine in a part of urine where you urinate, take the urine, put it into the dough, and tomorrow all your Jews of Frampol will be eating your dough. You'll get your revenge. Which, by the way, after the war, that was what Jews were thinking. Mm -hmm. right? There were units of people looking to take revenge. To poison the, the water. To poison the water, mm -hmm. exactly. To poison the water. And, and so it's like pouring the urine into this. But then when he does it, uh, the voice of Elka comes to him and says, oh my God, look at me, I'm black here, I'm suffering here in hell. Don't do this, don't do this. And so he doesn't. And then what? And then Gimple takes everything that he has, gives it to his children, and goes off into the world. And he says, there is really, you know, today I tell a story and it's a story and nobody, it's not true, but tomorrow, what do you know? These facts become real. And, um, and then at the end he says, well, he has nothing. He will um, die a beggar and he will lie on his bed and just uh, expire. But when he dies, he will go to heaven, and there, and this is, this is unbelievable uh, in this world, okay? No doubt the world is entirely an imaginary world, but it is only once removed from the true world. At the door of the hovel where I lie, there stands a plank on which the dead are taken away. The grave digger Jew has his spade ready. The grave waits and the worms are hungry. The shrouds are prepared. I carry them in my beggar's sack. Another schnorrer is waiting. Whatever may be there, it will be real. Without complication, without ridicule, without deception. God be praised. There, even Gimple cannot be deceived. This is, this is Bashevis's ending uh, of this story. So this is um, so ambiguous, so brilliantly ambiguous. From Gimple's point of view, he has lived his life at the end. The world is also maybe an imaginary world, but the real world, well, in the real world, Gimple cannot be deceived. Okay, who are we as the readers? Are we the very smart readers who are laughing at the end saying, but Gimple, you're the guy who's always deceived. So isn't when you say there you can't be deceived, isn't that the ultimate deception? So if we want to, we can say, this guy dies with the ultimate deception. On the other hand, that's not what the story is saying. The story written from within Gimple's point of view, he's made his choices. Right, is saying, this is how I die. I die with this knowledge that the world is the way I have made it and see it. This is uh, the world of God's perfect judgment. And God's perfect judgment remains God's perfect judgment. That is to be trusted. It's not our world here, but we dare not give up on it, right? What's the, the connection or the disconnection between Rabbi Nachman's Tam and Gimbel Tam? What do they have in common? Where do they differ? Ah, uh, well, let's, you tell me too. Um, where the, what they have in common is, is this 
radical differentiation. And that speaks to me very, as I said, you know, uh, this is uh, very anti uh, most of us, I would say, because, you know, we say, for example, here you say now, an Israeli Jew, a Jewish Israeli, we say modern orthodoxy. We say, you know, we say, um, you know, we want to marry the liberal conservative perfect golden mean. We all have this idea that, um, of course, we can live with this balance of having to be a very good person within the knowledge of evil. I mean, most of us believe that and most of us try to live by it. But philosophically, these two writers did not see it that way. Philosophically, because of the crisis that they were facing, they took it to the extreme. And it's as if they said, yes, but don't you see that the choices are not union in the middle. The choices really are very difficult. And if you are going to make the choice, they were both with the Tom here, with the Tom against the Chacham. You know, it's, it's a uh, revaluation of values, you know, you always say with Nietzsche, you know, but this is their own reevaluation of values. Um, yes, we know the Jewish people. It believes very much in the mind, it believes very much in the individual intelligence, yes. And for the most part, we do, we do. But you see, in a time of crisis, um, there is a moment at which you stand before an ultimate. And these two writers have pushed us to that extreme, you see. And uh, they don't give us an easy, happy ending. They give us a happy ending, each in his way. But it's not an easy one at all. Not easy, but uh, sometimes, like maybe like our time now, there's something very deep to learn from, from them and what they were trying to teach us. Oh, I think so. And I'm so grateful for this opportunity we have to talk about these works. I thank you for this blessing. Thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you. Thank you.